the interesting things is uh, with a ferromagnetic material, these electrons uh, tend to line up parallel to each other, but the superconductor wants them to line up anti-parallel. Yeah, so we can just talk so, so what happens when, when um, yeah. we stick a ferromagnet next to a superconductor? Yeah. function, psi, and it's happy in the superconductor, and it comes along, goes down, and then into the normal metal, you can get this proximity effect. So in the normal metal, you can see some superconductivity penetrates into the normal metal. Well, first of all, why does the wave function decay in the superconductor? I mean, it's still in the superconductor. Why is it going down? So, if you remember, the, super, the Cooper pairs are of a finite size, so you can think of this coherence length as roughly the size of a Cooper pair. So, within the distance, the size of a Cooper pair to the normal metal, the superconductor is feeling the normal metal, and the normal metal destroys superconductivity. The superconductivity can't exist in the normal metal over very large length scales. So we are actually suppressing the superconductivity as well as inducing some superconductivity in the normal metal at the same time. So we get a bit of both. Okay, I mean, so what, what sort of numbers are we talking about here? Right, so in a normal metal, if you have a nice clean normal metal, something like copper, this coherence length can be several hundred nanometers, even upwards of microns. So this is, can penetrate, in thin film terms, a very large distance into the normal metal. So what happens if we change the, the normal metal for a ferromagnet? But it turns out, actually, that it doesn't just decay. We get a decay, but we also get an oscillation as the superconductivity is destroyed in the ferromagnet. The wave function is actually changing sign, so down here we have a negative sign. So what does that actually mean? Right, well, <laughs> be before we get onto that, the important thing, I, this picture is probably deceptive, we should say that coherence length in the ferromagnet now, which is analogous to this one, the picture here is not to scale, this is much shorter in the ferromagnetic material, because remember we have spin electrons aligned in the ferromagnet and the Cooper pairs are anti-parallel in the superconductor. So this suppression acts over a much shorter length scale. This is the bilayer, so obviously what we can do is just add another superconducting electrode over here and we can make a Josephson junction with a ferromagnetic barrier. So what you can consider is two bits of superconductor with your ferromagnet in between. So now what we have to think of is we have to think of this oscillation and we have to think of how this oscillation fits into this distance, which is the thickness of the ferromagnetic barrier. Well, that's the thing we can control in our deposition system. Exactly, yeah. So if we're careful, if we just put our axis for zero in here, if we choose this thickness very carefully, we can chop off this oscillation and the appropriate point, and what we can do is achieve something like this. So, so what we've done here is we've, we've made this thickness as barrier so that the thickness corresponds to something like it going down to a minimum at the, the, down here on, before it gets to the other side. Yes, exactly. So then as you, so as you scan through the, the thickness, you can, you can see the critical current of this chosen junction oscillating as we see this oscillation in the ferromagnetic material. Okay, but what, I mean, what does the, the, the negative... Uh, amplitude of the, the wave function actually mean? Right, so in terms of the Josephson current, so if you think of the current through the Josephson junction, that's going to be related to the overlap of these two wave functions. And because we have a minus sign here now, what we can do is we can write the standard Josephson relation, so the current is equal to IC sine phi, where this phi is the phase difference between these two superconducting electrodes. But because of this minus sign, we now have a negative critical current. Now, if we assume this sinusoidal relationship, we can just write this instead as something with a positive critical current, but with the phase shifted by pi. So it's like the, the junction is actually built in a permanent pi phase shift. Yeah. So the ground state, the minimum um, free energy, the ground state of this junction is something with a built-in pi phase difference between these two electrodes. Yeah. 
exactly. The, the work that's being done at the moment has mostly been directed towards creating uh, static pi junctions in this sort of structure. And what you're looking for, the signature of this, is a plot of critical current versus the thickness of the ferromagnetic layer, where that the critical current should be modulated by this thickness. And you should get a periodic variation between the zero and the pi state uh, associated with the decoherence of the Cooper pairs as they tunnel across the ferromagnetic barrier. And work that we've done has been aimed to create an active version of this by instead of having a single ferromagnetic layer, replacing this with two ferromagnetic layers with a normal metal spacer, so copper with two F layers here, for example. This is now uh, effectively a spin valve, so you get a change in resistance depending on whether the magnetic moments are parallel or anti-parallel. If we think just about the resistance, we have a conventional spin valve here. And so the response you get from this is that the resistance rises to a high value and then drops, and the return curve will do something similar with zero field here. And this is a consequence simply of the spin scattering associated with uh, the interfaces. And we're using it here as a signature um, to test whether we've got the correct alignment of the ferromagnetic layers. But in principle, there should also be changes into the superconducting transmission across this, depending whether it's parallel or anti-parallel. And so we look to see whether or not we see a difference in the critical current, depending on the, le the orientation of the two ferromagnetic layers. We've seen this, but it's hard uh, at this stage to be absolutely certain that what we're seeing is a switchable pi state. So, great, but... What can we do with this? How do we know that we've actually got one of these? Right, so it's, it's not, not so obvious that this is really a pi junction. We have to be a little bit careful about really deciding that we have one of these junctions. Um, one of the ways you can do that is to actually combine one of these new pi junctions with a zero junction. So you can think of making a DC squid. So we have our squid loop with two Josephson junctions in it. And if we can, we can make these two junctions different. So we can make this junction say a pi junction and then we can make this a zero junction. So this is just a junction with a standard critical current with none of this built-in pi phase shift. Now the question is what happens when we measure the critical current against applied magnetic field for this DC squid and it turns out it's, it's quite think, simple to think of the analogy with, with optics again. Instead of the standard squid behaviour, so the standard squid behaviour gives us this Young's double slit modulation. In this case, with this pi phase shift, we actually get a minimum critical current at zero. So we have the complete opposite. So if we can be really sure we've got zero magnetic field, we can see whether we've got a pi junction or not a pi junction, depending whether we have a minimum or a maximum yeah. in the critical current. Exactly, exactly. Okay, well, let's make things even simpler. What would happen if we just took out the zero junction and just had a superconducting loop with a pi junction in it? If you do that, if you remove this... Because now we've, we've got a situation where on one side of the junction we have a, a positive phase difference, on the other side we have a negative phase difference, but these two are joined up. So you, you can't have that. You can't have a continuous piece of superconductor with two bits of phase which are different. So that must mean you have a spontaneous current in the loop. And that's what you see. So if you have a pi junction in a loop of superconductor, you will spontaneously generate a current because of this pi phase shift. And I mean, how much current do we know that? So that current has to produce half a flux quantum in the junction. Because one flux quantum in, the jun in, in a loop would give you um, a, two a two pi phase change. And now we only have pi, so we need to compensate for that value of pi. But presumably we can't say which way round the current's going. We don't know whether it goes clockwise or anticlockwise. No, no. So, so that, that sign change. The sign change, so in the D-wave case, when you have your 
D lobes, you have um, you have positive and negative um, signs to your order parameter in the, something like the high TC superconductors. These positive and negatives are very closely analogous to the positives and negatives we have in this system. So you can actually achieve exactly the same type of effect with and the high TC compared to the ferromagnets. And the way we do that then is we make a an S wave superconductor contact and, and tie those up, up. Yeah. up like that. <laughs>